um, our drush for this week um, from Parashat Toldot, as the Antifam was saying, which means um, generations. I've called this um, Porsche, I've called my drush today Generations of Animosity, and um, you'll see why very soon. Um, I'm basing my readings on Genesis 25 and um, Hebrews 12 today, but the um, full readings are as on the screen. So I want to give a brief nutshell of the parasha. It's actually very, again, Genesis has lots of narrative um, and it's full of much you know, meaningful narrative. Um, but the bulk of this parasha is dedicated to Yitzchak and Rivka, or Isaac and Rebekah, and their family. Um, Abraham has just died and he is buried. And then, uh, of course, the, um, the highlights of this is the, um, sort of the back and forth between the twins. So between Esau, or Esau and Yaakov or Jacob and of course we read about the selling of the birthright and I'm going to be talking about some of the consequences some of the long-lasting physical and spiritual consequences of of this and um, of course um, I've written the Esau blessing Jacob it's actually Isaac of my apologies um, as a typo Isaac um, blessed Jacob of course he's of Esau as we know the, the, the firstborn I'll talk about the firstborn um, shortly and of course, um, after that, Jacob has to flee to his uncle, um, so his mother's brother, Laban, and he has a very big role in later portions, um, but for now, he's just the place of refuge for now. Um, in the meantime, God reaffirmed um, the Abrahamic covenant with Isaac. So this is um, why as, as um, Messianic um, Jews and also as, um, as Christians and, and you know, all the believers in the Messiah, we, we um, say that um, you know, the Abrahamic covenant, the promises that came with that covenant goes through um, the Jewish people because um, instead of going through Ishmael in, in the biblical narrative it goes through Isaac and then Jacob and then Jacob is eventually renamed Israel and therefore his children are the children of Israel which are the ancestors of the modern Jewish people so that's um, some of the biblical narrative which supports that and of course um, a very another peculiar scenario, um, scenario here is when Isaac you know how Abraham likes to tell other people that um, his wife Sarah was actually his sister because he didn't want to get killed well, Isaac does the same thing with Rebecca when he settles in Gerar. And again, same sort of thing happens. They find out some other way and then Isaac looks like a fool and then um, they look also silly. And then, long story short, um, nothing happens. But it was, again, a very similar scenario. So I, I do want to focus um, specifically on this part of Genesis 25. This is verses 20 to 28. And it's the discussion about essentially when the twins were in the womb and um, some of the significance and the prophecy that comes from this as well. So this is an ESV translation. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padanaram, the sister of Lavan, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her and she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter and man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, um, of course, um, this portion goes into great detail um, regarding the struggle between the twins, and it was there from the very beginning. So, so it's a curious description. Esau was already hairy and, you know, red. Like, he was already earthly. I think this is like trying to say he was already earthly when, since, ever since he came out of the womb. And it seems like a very natural conflict. So we've actually got a physical contrast. We've got a contrast between Esau, who was a man of the outdoors. He was sort of like a, you know, a hunter, you know, sportsman, sort of like a more athletic type. And you've got Jacob, who was sort of, you know, who liked to sit inside all day and, um, um, was more gentle, like a gentleman, essentially. So again, we've got a physical contrast here. And unfortunately, we've got the parents here, Esau and Rebecca, um, who, according to the scriptures, they actually favor different sons. So Esau, um, um, oh, I keep saying Esau and Rebecca, sorry. It's actually, um, I'm not sure why I keep saying that. So Isaac and Rebecca, my sincere apologies. Isaac and Rebecca, um, that's why it's important to listen to the service, not only to get the slides afterwards. 
uh, I'm just trying to excuse myself. So Isaac obviously favored Esau because um, of, you know, he, was, you know, he provided for the family, he gave food for the family, but Rebecca favored Jacob. And God implies in his prophecy here that there's a generalized greater significance within the family struggle. So, of course, these two, as we know from hindsight, they will eventually develop um, different lineages, different um, descendants, different pathways, and eventually different nations. And we'll talk more about that a bit later. And of course, we're going to the birthright situation. So the struggle continues there. I don't have time to go into that in a huge amount of detail, but it's worth touching on it. So, of course, um, we may be asking today, what's the big deal? It's just a blessing. It's just words. What's the big deal about um, you know, the birthright of the firstborn? So it actually had a, a very um, acute significance in the ancient world. Um, it actually had a lot of significance until relatively recently, maybe um, several hundred years ago, maybe um, at the latest. And it had physical earthly significance. So the firstborn would inherit double from the father and that would be um, preference in terms of inheritance. So that's obviously a physical um, perspective, but also that person will also carry authority. So um, it's in a similar way to you can imagine um, a king who is about to end his reign, he establishes his authority onto his successor. It's a similar way within the family. So you've got the father who would establish his, um, you know, who, who would um, establish um, the person who would carry his mantle within the family, and that would be the firstborn. That blessing was almost the, um, the symbolism of that passing of the torch, so to speak. And, and there are many similar things, like um, even today, like for example, um, you often have father sons who. Um, when the son gets a bit older, they often compete for influence and sometimes um, it might be very mundane things like, you know, you go play tennis one day or you go camping one day and then eventually your son, um, you know, I'm not dad myself, but I can imagine what it was like for my father, like um, eventually your son beats you at something uh, and then it's like, oh, you know, you're a man now. So it's, it's, it's almost like also with, um, in, a, in a scriptural, in a, not scriptural, in a spiritual sense, um, with the bar and mitzvah as well, when the Jewish come of age, it's almost um, the passing of the torch. So I think that, of course, had great significance today and also even more significance back then. And initially, it looks like that Jacob took advantage of Esau because Esau went hunting all day. He was famished. He was like, oh, just give me this soup. Give me this lentil stew. I'll do anything. And then it looks like Jacob took advantage of that from a very plain meaning of the text. However, um, and I, I think there is more to this and the Jewish commentators have a lot to say about this, which I will go into. Um, but it seems, um, you know, from, from a simple um, superficial reading of the text that Jacob seems like a very tricky, um, cunning person. So um, again, it doesn't paint him in the best lights, but the rabbis go into great, um, go into great lengths to explain um, that actually Esau was the bad guy, essentially. So I will try and talk about, about some of this. Um, the Bible also does hint at this slightly. It says that Esau despised his birthright. So it wasn't as simple as the simple um, reading would suggest, but what does this mean? So there are many commentators who, as I said, go into great details and great lengths to try and explain why Esau was the bad guy. Of course, uh, it makes sense because from a Jewish point of view, Jacob was the one who through the promises went. So it makes sense to try and explain him as the good guy. So um, it, it's based mostly on Rashi. So Rashi was, um, his, it's an acronym for Rabbi um, Solomon, the son of Isaac, or um, Shlomo um, Yitzchaki, or Shlomo Ben Isaac, um, who was essentially a French rabbi about 1,000 years ago, about 900 years ago now. And he is a, um, a well-renowned scholar of the Torah and, and the Talmud, and um, Jews today almost hold his words as, um, you know, not as binding, but of course have very significant weight. So his, th this um, paraphrasing of um, the explanation is based on his um, commentary. So basically, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the fact that um, according to Jewish tradition, um, Esau was a sinful person and it is somehow inferred, um, I think it was based on some of the Hebrew, um, um, that he had a reputation for killing not only animals but also people. And the reason why, actually I remember now, the reason why he had the reputation was based on the Hebrew word ayef. So ayef is um, tired, um, it's a simple meaning, but ayef um, in scripture, is, and it's, ayef is used in this context of Esau being tired after hunting but it's also used in scripture to talk about people who are tired from killing. So the rabbis pulled this sort of very midrashic, very, I guess we would call loose association, but they found a symbolic um, 
conceptual connection between the two, and therefore they infer that he didn't only kill animals, but also was a very violent person and killed people. That's what they um, infer from that. Um, also, uh, that they sort of portray Esau as a bit of an animal, a bit of a beast. And I guess in the sense that um, he seemed to value you know, physical pleasures and food above all else. And um, in Rashi's commentary, um, he actually pointed out that um, Jacob was actually preparing a mourner's meal. So the reason why lentil stew is a mourner's meal, um, it actually is it was a traditional mourner's meal, is because so lentils were around, which obviously symbolizes the cycle of life. And um, they were supposed to um, eat that with respect. And I think the reason why um, Jacob was preparing this meal was because, of course, their father, Isaac, was dying. He was already old, he was blind. And the reason why Isaac wanted to bless Esau was because he knew he was dying. So um, the rabbis inferred here that um, Jacob was trying to prepare a, mourn a mourner's meal, essentially, essentially. And the fact that Esau just had no respect for that, of course, if that was the case, Esau showed no respect towards that. It sort of showed that he was a bit of a beastly, sort of, you know, classless sort of person, essentially, according to Jewish um, tradition here. And therefore, um, this, um, the rabbis inferred that it made Esau unworthy to be the one who would carry the, you know, carry the covenant, essentially. And um, therefore, eventually, you know, serve God through, their, you know, through his descendants. A very, very short paraphrase there, but essentially what the rabbis were saying was that you know, Esau was not a godly person and was more sinful than you know, the, the scriptures actually hint at superficially. So that's why he wasn't suitable. Now, um, I will actually, and actually the New Testament, the Brit Chalashah actually does lend some support for this idea. And I'll just read from Hebrews 12. And this is from ESV, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be out, put out of joints, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So again here, um, we, we've got a situation here where um, even the Brit Chalashah puts Esau at odds with God's purposes. It sort of builds on the idea that he despised his birthright and putting Esau at odds with uh, what God wanted. Esau is described as sinful directly. And it also explains something very interesting, which is actually a lesson to us today, um, which the, the Brit Chalashah brings, was meant to bring to us. It, it says that Esau repents. So eventually Esau does realize his mistake and he says sorry and he says to uh, Isaac, please bless me as well. But then it was too late. The blessing was already given. And the, the Brit Chalashai here in the book of Hebrews is trying to warn believers that it is time to repent before it is too late. So it's, it's, it's saying here there will come a time that even if you want to repent, you won't be able to. And judgment will come on the earth anyway. And it, it's saying here that for them, but also for people they come in contact with to help them repent, to help bring people close to God and ha have them accept the grace of God before it is too late to repent. So that's um, a warning um, for them and also a warning for us, using Esau as an example. But back to the, um, um, today's portion, um, most of us will be familiar with the fact that Jacob was renamed. He was renamed to Israel. And that's, um, you know, even the modern nation of Israel, we, we take our name from that. And his children will become a nation of Israel. Esau's lineage is a bit more confusing. I think it's actually worth analyzing the, the lineages because it also does shed some light on some, I guess, some spiritual struggles and physical, of course, as well, but also some spiritual struggles and spiritual tensions throughout, um, you know, throughout history. So Esau and Jacob eventually reconcile according to the scriptures, but they also separate afterwards. It was sort of a cold piece. Esau eventually settled in the land of Seir, and Seir is approximately southern Jordan today, uh, and it is also called Edom. And we know that he's called Edom because of the verse, Genesis 36, verse 8, which um, I won't go into today, but that's the source. Um, the Edomites, named after Edom, were also a nation in their own right, and they became entrenched to the south of Judea. So they were also supposed to be pushed out, um, but they were, a freak, uh, they were a very frequent thorn in Israel's side. So they never really fully went away, and they always took the opportunity to harm Israel, or more commonly, because they were quite small, they would team up with Israel's enemies. So they actually teamed up with um, the Assyrians when the first temple was destroyed, and um, the biblical um, 
prophets never forgave um, Edom for this. And actually, there were many prophecies of um, Edom's judgment because of this um, betrayal and this, um, um, you know, the harm that they caused to Israel. And Psalm 137 verse 7 actually gives some scriptural reference to this as well. Again, I wish I had time to go into all this, but um, for the sake of um, time, I'll skip over this for now. So fast forwarding into the, you know, the period between the, t- the two testaments, between the Tanakh and the Brit Balashah, um, we've got essentially a period where um, you know, we have texts, but the, they're not um, you know, canonized texts, but they are very useful texts. So one of them is the, are the books of Maccabees. And um, the books of Maccabees are, of course, they contain the, you know, parts of the Kalanika story as well. But um, they also contain much of the history regarding the Greek influence and the Greek, um, the struggle against the Greeks in Judea. And um, the, um, the Jews, um, the Maccabees, they actually went to war against the um, Greek influence many times. And part of the Greek influence was a nation called the Idumeans. And um, this is actually referred to as Esau directly in the book of First Maccabees. So I'll read this verse. And Judah and his brothers went out and made war on the sons of Esau in the land of to the south. And he struck Hebron and its daughters and tore down its fortresses and burned the towers all around it. So again, this is from um, 1 Maccabees 5 verse 65. Um, afterwards, the Edomites were actually permanently subdued. So this is actually a, a final victory against the physical Edomites. So until this time, so thousands of years, they were a thorn on Israel's side and then eventually the Hasmonians, um, who were the di- dynasty set up by the Macca- Maccabees, they actually managed to permanently militarily subdue the Edomites. And many of them actually converted to Judaism as well, because um, not because they really believed in Judaism, but because they were um, militarily pressured into doing that. In, in those days, um, the Jewish nation was actually much more, um, you know, much more prone to proselytizing compared to today. And in this way, um, the prophecies were actually fulfilled. fulfilled. So we talk, remember the prophecies when there will be one who will be stronger than, than the other, but the older shall serve the younger. So if you look from a, for a physical fulfillment, this is actually the physical fulfillment. So, um, of course, Edom was stronger than Israel. Um, they had many powerful allies. So from a physical sense, they were stronger. But also they were eventually fully conquered and then they eventually were serving um, the younger. So eventually the Hasmonean dynasty conquered the um, Edomites and then the Edomites were actually serving the Israelites. So from a physical perspective, that's the fulfillment of the prophecy. But there's also, of course, a uh, much a more pervasive spiritual um, um, fulfillment as well, excuse me. And I, it depends from what perspective you come from as well. So, of course, you can have this perspective that, of course, Esau was a man of the world. He was physically stronger because he went hunting and was, did exercise compared to Jacob. But, of course, um, we know that Jacob was the child of the promise and therefore Esau would serve him. So that's another fulfillment, spiritually speaking. According to the rabbis, though, they had a completely different understanding. They actually understood Edom not as the Edomites um, you know, in southern Jordan, but also had a spiritual equation, which was with the Gentiles, essentially, and essentially the Romans. And also some of them actually extended this to Christians as well. So, and the, the source for this actually comes from the, the, the Jerusalem Talmud. Um, and I'm just quoting here. It was taught. Rabbi Yehuda um, ben Rabbi Eli Baruch said, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who used to offer this homily, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. This is from Genesis 27, of course. The voice is the voice of Jacob crying out because of what the hands of Esau did to him at Betar. So this word Betar is very, very important. So Betar was the last stronghold of the Jewish people militarily. So of course we know that the temple was destroyed in about 70 AD, but The exile didn't really start in earnest at 70 AD. What essentially happened was um, the Jews were expelled from Jerusalem, but they actually, most of them didn't really leave Israel. They were actually, um, they settled in the Galilee basically, mostly, and they actually managed to establish some strongholds in the Galilee. And the rabbis were instrumental in reorganizing Judaism and keeping it going. Essentially, they became became a leader in about um, 135 of the Common Era, so about 65 years afterwards, called... Um, Shimon Bar Kokhba, or Simon, uh, son of the Tsar. And the son of the Tsar was actually a reference to him being potentially the Messiah. And there were many people, because he was a strong military leader, who actually initially brought some victories to Israel. So he actually, um, his forces managed to um, sort of hold back the Romans for about three years. And actually, they had some victories in the, at the start. So people were very excited. They thought, finally, we're going to be re- redeemed. Finally, we're going to be delivered from our um, enemies. And they thought that, including so many great rabbis, 
they thought that he was the one to deliver Israel, so he'd be the Mashiach. Of course, um, that didn't happen. Betar also fell in about, in about 135, the Common Era, and that defeat actually caused probably even more damage than the defeat at 70 AD, because this was a time when the Romans basically said, no, these pesky Jews, they, uh, they were thrown outside for long enough, and they were actually, um, you know, most of the Jews were, were banished from the land. They really tried to force the rest of the Jews out of the rest of the land of Israel. And this is the, probably this is um, the true start of the diaspora. So again, it had a very, very negative consequence. And in this context, of course, it, may, it seems to um, infer that um, Edom is, um, and Esau um, are equated with at least the Romans. And of course, um, the seat of Christianity eventually became Rome. And therefore, because um, of, unfortunately the persecution um, by Christians against Jews continued for, for, you know, throughout the ages and throughout the time the Talmud was being written, many rabbis equated the, sort of the, um, the successor of Rome as Christianity. And therefore, Edom is often seen as Gentile Christianity being, again, a thorn in Israel's side. That's how, how many people interpret this. Um, now, of course, if we were to use this as our, as our context for the prophecy, we can still get to a fulfillment of the prophecy here. So, of course, Rome was stronger than, you know, Israel because they were more militarily, economically, you know, they were greater than Israel. But of course, in the terms of, you know, of, of the Messiah, in terms of, um, you know, messianic perspective, um, Rome did actually um, come to serve the Jewish people in the sense that um, Christians eventually would serve the Jewish Messiah. So even in this context, um, the prophecy is fulfilled, but just in a different way. Again, I'm not really saying I 100% agree with this. I think it's a very loose um, association, but it is very interesting to think of how the rabbis interpreted this situation because I do think it does teach us some lessons and maybe accounts for some of the animosity spiritually between um, you know, Jew, and Gentile, Jew and Gentile perhaps throughout the ages as well. So we'll stop there, I think. Oh, I've got one more slide, I think. So it also could be seen, um, as, I, as I said before, as ultimate proof between this, the struggle between Jew and Gentile, as I mentioned. Um, Paul in the book of Romans actually hints at this as well. He actually says in Romans 11, as regards to the gospel, they are your enemies for your sake. So that's, of course, referring to the fact that the Jews were against the gospel at the time. Um, but as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefather. So still, of course, Paul here is reminding them that the Jews are still chosen and loved, but um, for the sake of the gospel, they are you know, enemies because they're obviously competing for different points of view. Um, and the writings of the Brit Kalasha also explain that um, the natural order of things was actually for the Jews and the Gentiles to not mix. So... Um, Again, it sounds very cynical now because obviously we have a different reality, but actually it was not the norm for Jews and Gentiles to be friends um, until, you, you know, until you sure came and actually even afterwards until um, people would have a born-again experience and actually um, come into the grace of God. So actually the fact that we can worship together in the community of Jews and Gentiles is actually not a natural thing. It actually only comes from the grace of God and his saving grace through Yeshua the Messiah. So I think that should be remembered as well as we celebrate our community as well. And um, we talk about one of the Messiah as well, and this is something that, again, we, I, I, I really want to remind us that this promise of um, being one of the Messiah is not something that, is, that was going to happen naturally. It was something that only God did through his grace. And I, I will read Ephesians. I'm using the um, Tree of Life version here, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, keep in mind that once you, Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision, by those called circumcision, which is performed on flesh by hand. At that time, you were separate from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So again, talking about this distinction between Jew and Gentile. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah, for he is our Shalom, the one who made the two into one and broke down the middle wall of separation. Within his flesh, he made powerless the hostility. So again, I'll, I'll finish there, but essentially, you know, this promise, this you know, amazing reality that we have today was only possible through the grace of Yeshua the Messiah. Again, the tide of history, the scope of history would not have led to this unless Yeshua intervened. So we thank you, Yeshua, for that today, and that we can come together in unity in Messiah.